failed to qualify for the Olympics coming up in 2021 or Olympics Tokyo 2020 if you still look at the websites and the commercials. And obviously this has qua- this has caused uh, quite a stir among a lot of U.S. fans as this is another big international tournament that the U.S. has failed to qualify for. And of course, you don't need to remind any of us about the failed qualification to the 2018 World Cup. But how big of an issue is this really? Well, I have two men that will help me parse together the answer to that question. And you've heard both of them on this channel. We've got Adam Record here, who, of course, you've seen plenty of times. And we have Sean Goodwin, writer over at the Kansas City Star. And we're going to break down this question. How bad is it that the U.S. is going to miss out on the Olympics? And, uh, Adam, I'll start with you just looking at generally here. Uh, is this how big of an issue is this for the U.S. to miss out on this tournament? I mean, I think it's pretty bad. <laughs> if we're going to be, you know, taking out a lot of words, it's pretty bad. You know, it's it's not doomsday scenario. I think there is quite a bit of overreaction personally, but I don't think any of that takes away from the fact that it is very bad that we still missed out. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I think when you look at this, um, you know, it, it's it, a lot of countries, they, they, they don't miss out on things like this. You know, we've seen Brazil win win Olympic gold uh, back in 2016. I mean, we've seen uh, Germany win Olympic gold before. Like these are the World Cup winners win in this tournament. So even though it's not on the level, it's not, you know, a senior competition, uh, I still think you know, it's it's just one of those things where if you're going to be considered near the top, as of course the U.S. wants to be, uh, you have to perform in any international tournament that comes before you, and the Olympics is included. Uh, Sean, you you have this kind of perspective uh, on this. So, from from your perspective, how bad is it that the U.S. is going to miss out on this? Yeah, no, you say I've got a perspective, Griff. I was a uh drinking away my sorrows last night and <laughs> that's my thoughts of thinking and yeah i'm english but you know i've been here 10 years and i'm invested in this team you know it's <laughs> i've been here for the failed attempts for 2012 and 2016 and you know those days were it was almost like it were the missing years of u.s youth talent so there wasn't a lot coming through you know mm-hmm. um i mean i'm thinking back to guys on that team well those teams got fails uh Alonzo Hernandez was on that team. Do you remember him? No, but now that you say it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Gideon Zelalalem, how did they say his name? I think he was on there yeah. for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the issue is, you know, we've, you know, we're here, we're in 2021, I guess, for the 2020 Olympics. Um, uh, as Adam was saying, it's not so much doomsday. It's, it's not like we're sitting here and saying that. Uh, the U.S. is doomed to lose to Honduras for the next decades because Honduras clearly has a better youth team than America. Mm-hmm. Like that's clearly not the point. Um, the, the point is that the U.S., as you kind of mentioned, didn't put in, you know, they put out basically a D-team, U23 team. It wasn't a, a heavy hiss as that we know the U.S. has. Right. You know, we've got Jeremy Obobese and Frankie Amaya, Cole Bassis, guys in MLS Weren't mm-hmm. called up, never mind you, Geo Rangers and Christian Pulisic and whatnot. Yeah, um, but you know, like you were saying, graphics, and you've got Brazil and Germany and Italy, they're still qualifying now, winning. But even if they were to do what the US is doing, and I mean, England's missed the last Olympics, for example, yeah. and I'm not saying England has a rich, you know, World Cup history. Okay, we've won one, um, it's more than the US, so it's, it's rich in that regard, <laughs> <laughs> but. It's the fact that a lot of those countries, obviously big soccer nations, they almost have the clouts where if you're missing Olympics, you're kind of like, oh, well, we know we're good anyway. We have the Euros or the World Cup coming up. I guess it's usually the World Cup after that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, for the US, we're, we're still in this phase of trying to you know, legitimize US soccer. And up until 1990, when it was, what, a 50-year drought or something stupid between... World Cup appearances, you know, ever since then, U.S. has been building and building to legitimize itself and say, yeah. you know, America soccer is here to stay. And when you're trying to do that, when you don't have the clout yet, you can't be turning your nose at chances like the Olympics, where mm-hmm. 
you know, it, it isn't a lot of teams' best squads. It might not be Germany's or Italy's or Spain's best teams, but they're still pretty good. Yeah. So America needs to go full out, you know, get deep, legitimize itself, show we're here for the future, and turning up the music, that opportunity, that's the yeah. issue here. That's that's the perspective yep. that, yep. that I really wanted to get because when you look at who the U.S. put out in this uh, qualifying match against Honduras, which they lost and subsequently eliminated them from the Olympics, um, you are not seeing a lot of players that are probably ever going to be capped at the senior team, and I believe only two on this entire squad who have been capped at the senior level. I could be wrong about that, um, but but certainly not many. Now, if you look at the senior team, and who the senior team boasts. You have basically uh, more than half the team is going is is under 23. So more than half the team would be eligible to play in this match uh, outside mm-hmm. of the three over 23 players that you get as your exception. Yeah. And obviously you have your heavy hitters. You have Christian Pulisic. You have Gio Reyna. You have Serginho Des. So you do have that level of player. But then if you go even a step down – players who haven't reached that level but still have so much promise guys like Josh Sargent, Chris Richards, Eunice Musa, uh even oh. Reggie Cannon who's been playing a lot, uh Nicholas Giocchini, like you could have put in that level of player and mm-hmm. I think you you probably would have beaten at, at least 75% of the teams in the world, which is not something that the US has been able to say before that there is so many young players that are at that level of skill. And certainly in the case of uh, Pulisic and Gio Reyna, you're talking about young players that are among the best in the world. Um, And that's not something the U.S. has been able to say before. So I do understand on the one hand that the Olympics is not an important tournament. It's not a tournament that a lot of nations look at as being a priority. Uh, But these, as you said, Sean, are nations that – have a very very deep list of young players that they can put in and like their fourth best team are still going to be high quality players the u.s Uh has never been in that situation before and so the opportunity to show the world that the u.s setup now does have that level of depth they do have a lot of young players that can get it done on an international stage Missing out on the opportunity to show that I, I think is going to be the biggest missed opportunity of this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think, now, go yeah, ahead. Go on. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally, I totally agree with everything you both are saying right now. I think that we, we couldn't have settled for some of the players we did. Like, like you mentioned, like we have players that, you know, might not be that 23 year old range as I'm like looking at the roster here. We have, you know, Aaron Herrera. He he played. I thought he played pretty well throughout most of the, the qualifying. He played right back. He's 23 years old. Mm-hmm. Hassani Dotson. I think some would say his stock kind of went up before the U.S. didn't qualify oh. <laughs> um, at age 23 as well. Benji Michelle. I think that's it's Michelle. I believe um, age yeah. 23 as well. Here's my thing. I don't care if they're 23. I care personally if they're ready, if they're good to play. And I think, like you said. We have younger players that are better than these players that are 23 that should have been playing. And that's kind of my gripe with the whole thing. I think this whole roster was kind of – it settled. You know, it's like we we settled. We're like, okay, yeah. we're going to take these players from these MLS academies and this is our settling. I mean, Tanner Testament, I think his only minutes came in that last game against Honduras. Yeah. And he looked by far outside of maybe Ewell, the only other player that wanted it. You know, that looked yeah. like he was hungry, ready to play. And I, I said to um, a buddy of mine that I used to work with that is also a huge U.S. men's national team fan. I, when we saw he was at the roster, I said, if he doesn't play, I don't think we qualify. Because Tessman's better than uh, Hassani Dotson. Tess, mm-hmm. uh, Tessman's better than Mihalovic. You know, I think Tessman's better than Andreas per, per, Perea. Yes, Andreas Perea. Yeah who all three of those guys got more minutes than him. And that's an issue. And I don't know why the coach, Jason Christ, couldn't see that or the staff couldn't see that. So my, I don't know. That's just my perspective on it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, my issue there, I mean, if you're talking about McField, is like Tessman and Ewell and Doxon. Mm-hmm. If, if you look at the makeup of that McField, and again, this is a coaching staff. This is a, um, this is a Christ. Like, he caused it. 
Uh, it's, look at good players that gave put out the six midfielders, basically. Yep. You've got five defensive-minded midfielders yes. in six midfielders box. And then you and the other one is Georgi Mihalovic, who honestly, yeah, he can play as a 10, but he's mostly been playing as a winger for club. Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, yeah, so, you know, obviously Jackson Ewell, he shows he wants to see. He got, got a hell of a goal, I have to say, as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. But it, when you're a U.S. team, uh, you know, your head coach comes out and says, yeah, we're, we're not the type of team who's going to hoof the ball up the field. We want to play out the back. And obviously, that led to Oakshower giving up that second goal. Um, mm-hmm. But even ignoring that, you say, oh, we want to play out the back. We want to play with the ball at the feet. And you don't have any crease of number eight yes. in the midfield. But what do you expect? What service are you expecting to give the forwards when you're tossing out a bunch of defensive midfielders in positions you're not used to? Like it's, and, again, that's just a poor coaching job, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it, I, I want to look at this from it, it, from a more general perspective. If we're looking at, obviously, for the U.S., 2026 is the goal. I mean, that's kind of, I think, where all the fans and the whole setup is looking for 2026 World Cup, the U.S. is going to be hosting it. That's going to be right in that window of the prime age for all of the U.S.'s best players. Uh, Mm -hmm. So looking forward, that's the big event. And I think for the U.S. building up towards that, to see the number of of great young players that are coming up and that are in their teens or early 20s right now that could have played in this game and didn't, Mm -hmm. I think... It just shows that even though the U.S. wants to be at the top, mentioned along with the the Brazils and the Englands and the Germanys and the Frances of the world in 2016, when you look at the last Olympic cycle back in 2016, um, you had Germany, who uh, be, was the silver medalist in that tournament. They didn't have any of their uh, senior, most of their senior players that were U23 at the time. They didn't have them like the top ones, but they did have that kind of second tier. If you look at some of the, some of the names that Germany took to the Olympics back in 2016, you'll see players like Jeremy Tolian. You'll see uh, Julian Brandt, Max Meyer. uh, And Mm -hmm. these are Timo Horn. These are not the players who were, who were starting, who were getting a lot of minutes for the senior team, but they were, getting called up. I mean, they were kind of on the on the fringes of the senior team, just kind of trying to break through uh, to get more caps there. And the U.S. could have done that. I mean, there, there, were, there are players out there that are, that are exactly at that tier that the U.S. could have put in this exact situation. Again, you didn't have to put Pulisic out there. You didn't have to put Reyna out there. But could you put Richards out there? Could you put DK out there? Could you put Sargent out there? Yeah, I think you absolutely could have. Yeah. And so... To see the U.S. blow this tournament off like it's nothing, um, I think it just I, – I can't get this idea out of my head that, that you brought up, Sean, and I absolutely agree with. You haven't earned this. The U.S. hasn't earned the opportunity mm-hmm. to blow yeah. this tournament off. And so the the level of players put out there, uh, I agree with, with what both of you said absolutely. That it, it, from the level that was, that was on display um, – it's not particularly surprising they didn't get the job done. These are not the best U23 players by far that the U.S. could have had. Um, so I more have an issue with the philosophy of the soccer federation in general to say that we're just going to go ahead and, and blow this tournament off. Uh, I think that's a damaging philosophy. You, there is there's something to be said for acting like you've been there, you know. But yeah. at some point, you do have to realize that you haven't been there. So act like you've been there means don't celebrate like you've won the World Cup when you qualify. You know, that's not the that's not the look you want to put out. But it doesn't mean blow off tournaments just because you think they're lesser. Uh, that's not something you've earned. And, and Sean, you had the opportunity. You were listening to uh, Peter Vermees, the manager for Sporting Kansas City, talk earlier. Uh, so you had the opportunity to hear some of his thoughts on this. And his thoughts uh, kind, kind of mirror that sentiment, if I'm correct. Yeah, um, honestly, I was waiting to interject. So I was going to cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't cut me off. I cut you off. <laughs> so you got me. Well, no. Um, yeah, you, it, I mean, you just segue right into it really nicely. And 
Um, basically, yeah, I was chatting with a piece of a meat earlier, and we had him on the press conference, and he has a very good viewpoint, actually, that you know he was on that 1990 squad that made the World Cup. Um, and he was actually on a Brian Bliss, too, who's um, one of the directors of Sports in KC. But anyway, off points. Um, he, he was saying, like, you know, back when they were playing through the 80s and they really didn't have you know, the players and the clout that the US has now, you know, get all the play, all the best players eligible at that age who were competing in Olympic qualifying, and you know they were traveling to Honduras and Guatemala and Costa Rica, and you know you you hear these names and you may think that oh it's they're not big nations, but right off the bat, if the US is thinking like you've really lost part of the basketball, let's be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's saying you know they get a tough games to go to. And then he's, he's saying it basically prepares them to, you know, when they made it to, like, the World Cup, for example, um, they were prepared to play hard for games, maybe in higher level opposition. Mm-hmm. But, you know, now you look at it now, when you've got guys like Anthony Robinson and Musso, and like I said, Josh Sargon, and Brenzin Aronson, um, all guys like that who are coming off the bench or they're playing friendly games in Northern Ireland. Yeah. And then you ask, and then you get to the Olympics and you're asking these same guys to now not the Olympics, go World Cup, sorry. You get to go World Cup in a couple of years and you're asking these guys to play at the top of the level and all they've done internationally is play meaningless friendlies against Northern Ireland and whatnot. Yeah. When instead, short to U twenty threes, but all of these teams, um, as you were mentioning about Canada were desperate and they put out a really good squad for these qualifiers. You know, these te- other teams, they are desperate to make the Olympics. They are trying their hardest for full 90 minutes. Yeah. And that's what builds these players up to then go on and be successful for their senior team. Yeah. Um, so when you're not even giving these guys a trial by combat, so to speak, you're, you know, you're, you're work- working them up, you're getting them used to that competition, and then you just throw them into the World Cup. They go, yeah. all right, We expect you to make the semifinals or something. It- it's not <laughs> going to work, right? Yeah, um, so that's that basically what Peter was saying, um, and he was, he was also saying just while we're on the topic of the sports in KC, uh, a player we haven't mentioned, who hasn't been touched by any of these teams, is John Luca Buzio. I was uh, gonna, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, hundred percent. Yeah, the kid's just talking number ten jersey at sports in KC. Um, at eighteen years old, the ball's on him. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I've had the pleasure of watching him since he was 15, 16. And Christ, he, he can ping the ball around. He can play the six. He can play the eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and y- y- again, it's going back to what I was saying before, how you go wearing any Tracy McFielders and you're throwing out guys like Johnny Cardoso or Hassan Yudoxen. And then that game was screaming for a creative eight. And that's literally a guy like mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it so kinda, that, yeah, that kind of big gist of what we talked about today. It kind of seems to me that the U.S. is like the, the the whole federation in general, the whole setup is kind of like they're trying to do everything at once. They're trying to be every soccer federation yes. in the world at once. You know, they're uh-huh. they're trying <laughs> to be the Germany's and the England's and the France's where they're saying we don't even need to care about the Olympics because our sixth best team could probably win that competition. Uh, so we don't need to care. They're not there. But also, the U.S. as a setup is trying to build from missing out on qualification in 2016, which mm-hmm. that's what they that's what they need to be doing. Uh, but they're not putting all their energy into that because they're also saying we need to build up the MLS because you know we need soccer to take more hold in America. So we need our top league to uh, to be able to you know, kind of be mentioned along with the top leagues, at least in North America, if not worldwide. So a lot of MLS teams are trying to keep players here so that they'll have their best teams for the season. But Uh you can't do that if the national team on a national and international level is failing the way that we've seen multiple national teams for the U.S. do in the past. So it feels like the entire setup is just splitting the baby in five different directions, and none of it is very conducive to actually building the game of soccer 
from the ground up the way that we saw, for example, Germany do in the early 2000s where their national team hit, had hit rock bottom. Their entire federation had hit rock bottom, and they had to build up from the ground. It did not look like this. Uh-huh. No, and I'm... let me... Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, go for it. Go, go on. Um, I was just going to I was gonna say, to your, to your point as well of what uh, Pierre Vermees said is and i'm trying i just sat here just trying to what listening while you guys were talking trying to find the tweet that i saw but it's actually it's very legit and i want to give this person credit but um they they went back and they found uh the competitiveness between the two squads i think our uh usa under 23 team played two games both of which were friendlies um in terms of this before this qualification whereas mexico's under 23 played 23 or 20 games, 20 to 23 games. I can't remember the exact uh, amount, but it's, it goes back to what you said. They, you, It's great to play friendlies, but they played to prepare to go and dominate and win this tournament, which is what they're doing. You know, it's, yeah. it's about that competitive aspect. And I, I just want to echo that. I absolutely agree with that. I think that there is no competitive spirit or no, um, these guys are not prepared. And it's crazy to say that professional soccer players aren't prepared when they've been playing soccer games their, their entire life. I get it, you know. Yeah. But, but as we know, it's playing at that level, playing at yeah. that level internationally mm-hmm. is a completely different beast. And especially when you're doing it competitively, yep. there is nothing that can pre- that can prepare you for that other than doing it. And when you have the weight of an entire nation pressuring you to qualify, right? Well, especially yeah. after what happened in 2018. Yes. It, it, Let's just even ignoring 2018, you know, Jason Christ came out saying he was talking about how the game, it was a lack of, you know, want and the mentality wasn't there. And, you know, it's kind of what you were saying, Adam, I guess. It, you know, mm-hmm. not being prepared almost. Guess what they said in 2016? The exact damn same. The ex- so, why, why, why have you not yep. And I don't know about 2012, but I assume it's like the same thing as well. Um, so well, why are you not fixing it? Well, what there's got to be something more institutional, even if you're changing coaching staff. So, this constant failure to qualify, you, you can't just start, pl- start blaming it on the players every single time, saying it's a lack of you know, want and mental mm-hmm. attitude when it's happening with different players, different teams, different coaches over and over and over again. Sure. Yeah, you're absolutely right. At that point, it's a philosophy from the entire federation, and you got to wonder where that's coming from. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I think, for me. I, I think what, what I want to get to is how this gets fixed, because I think there's a lot of debate about – you know, and and it's exactly what we spent the first twenty minutes of this video talking about. Uh, how bad is it? Is it you know? Are people overreacting? Should we be worried? That kind of thing. There's there's a lot of debate about that. But I want to go ahead with kind of the underlying assumption that let's say that we're going to take a the the way that we're going to look at it is pretty much what what we've said so far, which is that. It is, it's really bad that this has happened. It's not the end of the world, but there are some real underlying issues here that need to be fixed. So I want to then talk about how exactly we fix the underlying issues that we have discussed. And Adam, I'll start with you. How do we go about, as a soccer federation in general, how does the U.S. approach fixing some of these issues that has led to these problems continuing to crop up year after year? Oh gosh, that's uh, the big task that even the big guys that get paid for this stuff, I don't think know the answer to. But um, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. But I will say, I mean, from from I, our from, perspective, you know, just just to be fair to us, um, those people that get paid a lot of money to try to figure out things like this, sometimes it helps a lot to have kind of a fresh perspective, an outsider's perspective on something like this. When you are in the middle of it, it's hard to take a step back and see some of the more general issues that we as fans can watch play out on the field. Absolutely. And to your point there, I think where we start with it is, I mean, we start over. We, I think what we need, though, is a conductive plan. We need, you know, 
Berhalter looks like he's in it for the, the long haul for the World Cup. So we need someone that's going to work with Berhalter. Um, I believe, actually, I think we got rid of Anthony Hudson, who is a U-20 coach as well. So I think we get rid of Christ. I think Hudson's gone. I think we get we get maybe two guys that Berhalter really likes, and we have those three work together from you know player management side of things. Um, and then I think we just I I mean it's hard it's hard to say who to get rid of you know it, that works for the U.S. Soccer Federation, but I think that needs a little bit of a, a cleansing as well. Mm-hmm. Um, ag- again, I guess <laughs> you know <laughs> I think we just we need we just need different people but we need to like commit to it and like i guess for this next u23 coaching job or whatever i think we need someone who's not like christ who doesn't have a backup job because i think christ is coaching a usl league one team off the top of my head um or he's assistant coaching somewhere but he's he, he has a, you know what was that sorry he's a key assistant with into miami and, okay, That's well right. there you go. So, yeah. so he is a he is a comfy job elsewhere. Let's put let's maybe grab someone young, for instance. We'll say in my scenario, someone young. Let's grab someone young who's hungry to to, to prove themselves. Let's get them in. Let's get them working with Burhalter. That way we can coordinate players. Say, you know how Cole Bassett, uh, Busio were were left out. You know players like that. Say, well yeah. these are guys that we think can play for the senior men's national team. I'd like to get them competitive games right now for the U23s, you know, the next yeah. highest step uh-huh. for the team. I think that coordination is definitely what lacked, as we've mentioned. And I think it needs to start with hiring a coach that, you know, isn't comfy, that isn't, that's just a patch job. Like he was, Christ was a band aid. He was set to fail. And he, I don't think yeah. he has a great track record, anyways, but he was set to fail, yeah. in my opinion. So mm-hmm. I think that's kind of where we start. I don't know. You know, there's there's many other things that we can fix, but sure. you know, just in terms of this. The, so the three of us, uh, of course, you know, we we all dabble in the football manager a little bit from time to time, and uh, and I do think that there is something there, there's something there that I think is very important to realize. Um, obviously, you know, the football manager is so much different than than real life. It goes without saying. However, it is. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to I'm sorry to burst that bubble for you. <laughs> I do think though what does what is important is that whenever you play football manager, if you're coaching a big club that has multiple youth teams, the most important thing is that your youth teams are on the same page. You need your U23s to be playing more or less the same system. You need the you, you need the coach to have the same philosophy so that you know that the players that end up playing for you, the senior team, they know what the deal is. They can step in mm-hmm. and they don't have to learn new tactics. They don't have to learn new philosophies. They know what they're doing. That part absolutely must be the case in in real life at the club and at the international level and you see it when you look at when Pep Guardiola took over Barcelona and then kickstarted this whole tiki taka revolution and doing with Barcelona things that we haven't seen a club team do in decades and may never see again the the success that they enjoyed and so much of it was because when Pep Guardiola took over he said from the U8s to the senior team, we are playing the same formation. We are playing the same tactics. We are playing the same football at every single level of this setup. And so that means that the player who got in when he was eight years old in Barcelona, from the time he gets in to the time that he gets capped for the senior team, has been playing the exact same soccer for 12 years. And that, to me, is absolutely crucial. It needs to happen. For the U.S. national team, players need to know from the very beginning, from the Olympic development program to the senior level, players need to know how this team is going to play. And to do that, you need stability. And I think, Adam, you're absolutely right. You can't just have a Band-Aid coach at the the U23 level. You cannot just have a coach that you're going to plug in there and hope that he gets something right. You need to have some Mm -hmm. stability in the setup. Totally. Sean, uh, I guess what, so. what would you what would you do to, to to kind of fix a lot of these issues? Um, I mean, I guess just bouncing right off where you were talking there about from top to bottom. Again, this this is partly just because of my stupidly in depth knowledge of sports and KC. But, <laughs> uh, but no, I mean they, they do the exact same. Like they have their pro player pathway; it's been developed now for the past ten years or so. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the first real player to come out to was Eric Palmer Brown yeah. uh, way back in 2013. But, you know, since then, you look at Sports and KC. I mean, you've got Jalen Lindsay, Buzio, Cameron Duke to an extent, um, John Kemper now at Columbus, uh, Wilson Harris as with SKC too. But they're developing these players who can step into the first team. And I've talked to all these guys. I've talked to 16 year old Aussie Cisneros. Um, where you know he he joined Sporting when he was fourteen, and mm-hmm. uh, he was he was playing a, he's playing the exact same way as the first team was playing, and he just signed a professional contract at sixteen years old because he just progressed through all the teams so quickly, mm-hmm. and he, he didn't have to learn a new you know a new tactic or whatever. So then, you know bringing that back around to the US, um, yeah, it's kind of what you're saying. Scott from the Boston Open, you know maybe they are trying that to an extent, which is when you've got. You know, Christ saying things like, uh, we're not the type of team to push the ball up the field. We want to play it, you know, with our feet and whatnot, which is great if you're trying to do that from top to bottom. Yeah. But when you play it, either when you don't call up the correct players or not so much that, but you don't put them in a position to succeed. Mm-hmm. That, that's, the, that's the issue there. Where, you know, some of those players, sure, they're good players, but you try to run a tactic that they might not be used to and you haven't trained them on. Um, so that's my point there. But as for the question of how to fix it, um, I know that US soccer isn't great with uh communication wise with its <laughs> affiliated teams and all its players. Yes, I think um, that's definitely known. Yeah, but that's not a surprise. Uh, and you know, sometimes we do see teams getting I, you know, call ups. And, you know, things might have got a bit more tough recently, like Reggie Cannon going to Portugal and Brendan Aronson out the Red Bull. Yeah. Um, and that makes things a little bit tougher. But even, you know, here in the US, to, again, talking to Peter uh, Vermees, the about Buzio, you know, he was saying that he absolutely, you know, he might have had some concerns about sending a player away at the start of preseason, but he can never stop a player. And all it takes is talking to US soccer about it. And they've, you know, basically they never have done so. Um, Interesting. And obviously, you know, didn't get called up. But even, you know, down the level, see, there's not been much communication on that side of things. That's an issue. Um, Interesting. But... That's, that's alarming to hear, actually, because obviously when it comes to the U.S., there's a degree of things that the Federation can't control a lot of players have to be playing abroad. That's just a necessity. If you want them to get competitive matches against the best players on earth, they have to be playing uh, overseas. Um, And so that is something that's different from say Germany or England, where so many of their players are playing in that country. So it's very, it's very easy. Uh, Everything's very close. But even that being said to hear that there is little communication between the soccer federation and the MLS for the few for the few players that even will play in the MLS and then play at the senior level. That's very alarming. Yeah, no, it is. And um, let me see. Yeah, that, that's a huge issue. And my other part was just the whole idea of grassroots football. Which, mm-hmm. you know, it's what we've heard of. I take Germany resetting. I remember being as a kid in England, starting to get a whole grassroots football thing. And, I mean, I like the World Cup semi final with uh, not great team honestly um yeah. but it's yeah it's it's getting every single team from even the major leagues down through the youth teams who even if it's usl um all those you know more of the semi-pro leagues it's coming together almost and having one goal or one set kind of you know plan of action all mm-hmm. many of the I'm not going to say all the players, obviously. I mean, U.S. soccer can be so diverse, but having the best players very much train the same way or go through the same kinds of programs, and that way, when you get all these players at the top, um, I, I'm kind of losing track of myself now. Obviously, there's a lot of football <laughs> players, stuff like Reading and Pulis section and whatnot, but. Yeah. It's more below those guys when you when you see like a U twenty threes where it, it might not be a get a team, but you know even a couple of the lower guys get they can't hang against teams like Honduras and none of those guys are probably ever going to go on and 
you know, get caps for the US men's national team, let's be honest. Yeah. For a big part of guys just because they're you know trained at the grassroots level from you know when you were kids yeah. basically. It's all very hodgepodge. Mm-hmm. So it just it just totally. kinda feels like it kind of feels like a throwaway at the end of the day. Like none none of these very few of these players, I think we all agree, are ever gonna get caps for the uh, for the for the senior team. So what's the point? Why would you put them out there? You know, you're just it's almost like having a different team. You're just putting them in in the colors. You're putting them in red, white, and blue. You're putting the the U.S. flag on their crests, but they're not going to be factored into the bigger competitions that that matter more into World Cups, into Concacaf tournaments. Like, if they're not mm-hmm. going to be there, what's the point? Yeah, no, totally. No. Yeah, and I think on top of that as well, another I guess issue that. Or another change, I guess, we could playing on the same topic. Um, another change that could be made is I think we need to relook the MLS calendar. And I know it's been said many yeah. a times before, but a lot of these players, I mean, our roster is 90% MLS. Nothing wrong with that, and I have nothing against that. Oh, well, I'm just saying you look at Mexico's roster, and it's entirely from their own league, Liga MX. And they're in week, I just looked up week 11 of uh-huh. like 17 of yeah. the first half of their season. So these players are hitting stride. They are match fit. They're ready. And we have players coming back from preseason, you know, that are not ready. And to even for it's just crazy that we even, you know, get to the semifinals with players that are getting back into fitness. Imagine if we were, you know, at the same level as Mexico. Yeah. yeah, you know that it's yeah. just it's just it's a it's a simple thing, you know, just that extra bit of fitness. Let me tell you, I I just played my first game this weekend, um, w- like with a mask on and everything, and it was. Let me tell you, I'm not the most I'm I'm typically the more more fit person on the team, but it killed me to play. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. was I was gassed yeah. even with a mask on, which is fine, but more gassed than usual because I didn't realize now as I'm getting older how much fitness you know, it, you lose when you just take a little bit of time off. Yeah, and so I can sure. only imagine for some of these guys getting back into it that are only a year or two younger than me, how much that's really taken a toll on them. Yeah, so, yeah that's a good point. I, I wish I was joking. I completely agree. I mean, I've been playing soccer at least once, maybe twice a week for the last couple of months now, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, I have not played for the last two weeks. We had a bye week and I was busy the week prior. And yeah. Yesterday, I decided to. I was just out. I was outside drinking with my parents, and our dog was there. I was like, I'm going to play with the dog. And we ran up and down the gods. And I swear to God, it was about 90 seconds. And I was gassed. <laughs> but I didn't play soccer for two weeks. I was gone. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, these, these guys absolutely. It's crazy. Fitness, but you, and that's probably why you see. I mean, uh, for me, like the actual you know, U.S. Men's National Team, the senior team, yeah. a lot of those guys get in season right now. And, you know, I get we're calling up guys like Aaron Long and whatnot as well, who aren't quite as such. And Stefan isn't really playing for Man City much. But, you know, they, most of that team is in season. And then they can go out. And, again, Northern Ireland isn't a pushover. I mean, you know, it's not perfect. But, I mean, you go back... You, Beat Jamaica four one, smash Trinidad and Tobago seven 0 back in January. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm just, I guess the last game we didn't win was nil nil with Wales back in November. Mm-hmm. Uh, but these these are all games in the regular European season where mm-hmm. a lot of these guys are playing nowadays, and the US is walking out and winning games handily six two Panama six nil El Salvador. Exactly. And, again, yeah, that's only El Salvador and Panama. But hypothetically, Hong Joris is on the level yeah. of those teams. Well, and you're talking, you yep. know, let's let's not forget, we're talking about a team that could not pick up a win over Trinidad and Tobago back in 2018. So, yeah, yeah. you know, this this goes back to our conversation earlier. You want to act like you've been there. We we want ultimately the U.S. to be on another level. You don't want the U.S. to be having to compete at all with Panama and El Salvador. However. We do have to recognize as fans that the U.S. is not on that level yet, and they do have to prove that they have to prove again that they are not on that they are above that level. Um, and you know, to your point, if we're talking about the MLS calendar, if the U.S. wants to make sure that the MLS 
is going to be recognized if the U.S. wants to plant its flag at the summit of world football, then, you know, the way you do that is one through the international competition, but then you also have to have a respectable domestic league. And the U S right now is harmed obviously by not being in Europe where the top domestic leagues are, but the very least you could do is change your calendar so that you can support the, the national team and, and, you know, just by extension, uh, bring that level of success through the entire, you know, setup from from the national team on down through the youth leagues, um, and uh, you know, I, I do think ultimately, um, you know, what it comes down to for for the U.S. setup, um, you just you, you got to pick a philosophy. You just have to pick mm-hmm. what way, which way you're going to go, and uh, and you just have to commit to it. And if you're going to be the team that only cares about the senior team, then understand that, you know, you are putting all of your eggs into the, we're going to get youth over to Europe and have them playing young basket. It may work now because you have Gio Reyna playing for Borussia Dortmund as a teenager. You have Christian Pulisic and Sergio Dest, guys like that playing for major champions league clubs as teenagers. It may work Mm -hmm. now, it doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. I think it would be damaging if that's the philosophy that, that the U.S. decides to go mm-hmm. with. Yeah. Totally. yeah. It's, it's taking a step backwards. You've got this far. And if you don't capitalize on where the team is now, you're just going to either stay at this level at best-case scenario or you're going to waste this opportunity where you finally have a group of solid players. And you know, we, we say this a lot, Griff, and you mentioned it way earlier, the 2026 World Cup in America. Like... Christ, that, that could be a really good tournament for US if they play it properly. Yes. Um, and to, mm-hmm. to waste that opportunity to let those players, you know, get older and retire and to not replace them and not be able to, uh, because the, the strategy from the U18, the U16 level up isn't adequate. Mm-hmm. And that'd, that'd be a massive waste of potential and a shame, to be honest. Yeah. Except, except every back 15 years. Yeah. Totally. And, I guess like to I guess to base a point off of that as well is I mean we've heard the phrase before history repeats itself 2026 we won't have to qualify for that mm-hmm. world cup yeah so what are we going to do with those games in the meantime I mean we saw how a little bit of the effect it had on Brazil you know when they had yeah. the, the world cup as well yeah. they didn't have, they couldn't play Argentina Colombia um you know teams that normally are competitive in their nation that are competitive in the world cup. They couldn't play any of those teams. Um, what are we going to do when we can't play, you know, El Salvador, uh, Honduras, Mexico, you know, Canada, like yeah. nations like that. So, cause I don't think the calendar it might've changed a little bit, but the calendar doesn't allow for a lot of international friendly. So we really, I mean, if we want to get the most out of it, I think we, I mean, we, I think there needs to be a change sooner rather than later, you know, otherwise we, I mean, every, that tournament that everyone's looking forward to that we do have a lot of potential for, we could, we could be blowing it just because we're going to, history repeats itself and we're going to be underprepared is my concern for that slight tangent, but it's relatable (laughs) to how underprepared this U23 was because I I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a tangent at all, actually, because when you talk to you know, if you listen to uh, senior national team managers, if you listen to uh, federation presidents, all kinds of things like that, you know, what what you realize is a World Cup win, let's say for France in, uh, in 2018, that World Cup win in 2018 began building in 2008. You know, that's where that process began about training. Mm-hmm. You know, it began when superstar players, guys that broke out, Kylian Mbappe, for example, you know, he was, what, eight years old in, in 2008 or nine years old in 2008. Um, and that's where it began, making sure that players like that have the tools so that in 10 years when it's time to win a World Cup, that player is going to be performing at that level. And so for the U.S., when you look at, you know, 2026 coming up, um, if that process begins in 2016 when players like, you know, Gio Reyna was like was 12 and Kristen Pulisic was 16, you know, if that's where the process begins, um, Mm -hmm. we have to ask the question, has the U.S. setup prepared these players to play at that level over a 10, 12-year stretch? 
And, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe the answer is yes, but I do think at this point, given the way that the Federation looks right now, given the way the philosophy is, if those players are prepared to play at that level in 2026, it'll be because of their own desire to, to, um, to succeed, to perform for the U.S. while wearing American colors, and because of their clubs, it will not be because of what the U.S. Federation did from any level of, of training or any kind of setup that, 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 that they have. And to me, that's a problem, and you know something, something needs to change. The, the U.S. at this point needs to figure out that the preparation for 2026 is at the club level, it's not at the international level, and that's not what World Cup winners look like. That's not how those mm-hmm. those players prepare. Um, and to me, that's damaging, and this is just evidence. This U23, this not making the Olympics, that's just evidence of the fact that these senior team players have kind of been left out on an island by the Federation to hope that they'll be at the level they need to be to compete mm-hmm. for a World Cup championship in 2026. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Well... Totally. Hopefully, awesome. hopefully there will be a lot more to talk about in the coming days and months and years ahead of 2026. And of course, for the from the U.S.'s perspective, qualifying still to come for the uh, 2022 World Cup. And, uh, you know, there, there's there's still a whole lot to do for the senior team. And, you know, that here on GA Sports, we love us some U.S. soccer. So we will be here to talk about it all. And I know that Adam and Sean will be back and we can discuss all things USMNT going forward and even maybe a little bit of football manager discussion, because who doesn't love football manager? <laughs> right. Drop, Everyone loves yes, football. Drop, love it. It. drop a promo for our NWSL video. You know what? You are absolutely right because we have coming up Sean Goodwin here to break down the upcoming NWSL season, the major women's professional soccer league in uh, the United States. Uh, Sean's been doing a lot of work with that, and so we are going to talk everything that you need to know about that season coming up. Um, and that I'm really looking forward to that because you know there now that women's soccer is getting more and more and more eyes on it going forward with the success of the U.S. national team uh, on the international level, the NWSL now has more eyes on it than ever, and Sean is going to make sure that you know everything you need to know coming into the new season. So that will be dropping very, very soon within the next week here on GA Sports. So make sure you subscribe so that you can see that and subscribe so that you can hear the three of us talk about some great USMNT soccer going forward. Thank you all so much for joining us. Leave a like, uh, go into the comments if you have anything to say, and we will, of course, talk to you there. We appreciate you.